Are you going to wear this? Or no? No. Let's go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Uh, Heather Hancock, who is going to give us a talk about the impaired physician. Uh, Heather uh, grew up, she said, all over the country because her dad was active duty Navy. Um, she went to undergraduate at the University of South Florida uh, Medical School at the Uniformed Services uh, Medical School. Uh, and then uh, has been a resident here, spent three years uh, in the lab, and after this you are going active duty? Active duty CMC for critical care. For critical care. All right. Uh, help me weather. Uh, help me. Welcome, Heather. All right. Good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Um, so uh, today's talk is going to be, and thank you, Dr. Srenik, for the introduction. Um, today's talk is not going to be something that's going to help you on your ab site or on your general surgery recertification boards, um, but it is something that I think might help you in life and certainly a medical career. <clears throat> Today I want to talk about the impaired physician, and we're going to focus on substance abuse and mental health disorders. There's many things that can go into being an impaired physician, such as uh, if you have a stroke or you have a tremor that's so bad that you can't operate, or just you know declining motor skills with age. However, I wanted to focus specifically on these two topics because you can't cover everything in a one-hour lecture. So just starting off with a definition, the American Medical Association defines the impaired physician as the inability to practice medicine with reasonable skill and safety to patients. Patients, you know, that's one of the cruxes of this whole thing is safety of patients. By reason of physical or mental illness, including deterioration through the aging process, the loss of motor skills, or the excessive use or abuse of drugs, including alcohol. So looking at a historical perspective, William Halstead, who basically is the father of the surgical residency and brought, you know, uh, gloves to the OR that weren't um, cloth but were rubberized, um, became addicted to cocaine after he experimented on himself looking for a way to control pain. Um, him and his colleagues injected cocaine into their eyes, into peripheral nerves, and found that it worked very well. However, he then became addicted to cocaine and tried to cure himself with morphine. Now, neither one of these drugs were illegal in their time, so you have to keep that in perspective. But then, because of the morphine, he essentially became addicted to morphine his entire life. A more recent uh, example of an impaired physician is Dr. Stephen Miles. He's the professor of medicine and bioethics at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Uh, he's widely published on the topic of medical ethics and the ethics of torture, dealing with physicians uh, who torture patients, and uh, he's won numerous awards on humanitarian and uh, ethics. He's the author of The Hippocratic Oath and Torture. And unfortunately, he suffered uh, a lapse of bipolar disorder in 1995. And the Minnesota Medical Board um, wanted all of his medical records. And he refused. He said it was an invasion of his privacy and there was a false assumption that a mental health diagnosis or use of mental health services reliably predicts occupational impairment. He took this all the way to the Department of Justice and the, the Minnesota Medical Board uh, managed to avoid a lawsuit by continuing to renew his license uh, for the following three years. Uh, he does continue to practice at the Minnesota University of Minnesota Medical School and he is certified uh, board certified in internal medicine. The American Medical Association formally acknowledged the impaired physician as a serious problem in 1973. This was with the sick physician uh, treaties that they put out. In this, it states that if it's a physician's ethical responsibility to take cognizance of a colleague's inability to practice medicine, medicine adequately by reason of physical or mental illness. And this was really the first time that this had been laid out uh, in such a formally declared way. In the 1990s, the Americans with Disabilities Act was created. It's a Title I 
civil rights law that protects individuals with depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other mental health conditions in the workplace. It basically prohibits employers that have 15 or more employees from firing or refusing to hire or taking other adverse actions against people with real or perceived mental health conditions. It also strictly limits the circumstances under which an employer can uh, ask for information about these medical conditions and imposes confidentiality requirements on any information that they do uh, actually obtain. In 2002, a mandate by the Joint Commissions uh, on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations uh, delineated that all hospitals should have a physician wellness program that's separate from the disciplinary process. This has been a long movement towards going towards rehabilitation instead of discipline for medical illness, which was not always the case. Uh, it used to be perceived that uh, all of these were the fault of the individual and that it was uh, their own disreputable behavior um, that was the cause of their problems. So physician health programs were created. Fifty states have established physicians' health programs. They're separate from the state medical board. And their approach is non-punitive. It moves towards a rehabilitation, not a disciplinary process, again. It is supposed to allow a doctor to seek help without jeopardizing his or her career. And they have an individualized treatment contract depending on whether you have a substance abuse problem, a mental health problem, or a combination of the two. Uh, it's individualized with workplace monitors, um, substance uh, bottle, monitoring of bodily fluids, and things of this nature that pertain to your particular problem. And it's typically a five-year stint. So let's talk about the scope of the problem. You have to kind of put this in perspective. How common is this? So in the early 20th century, prevalence of impaired physicians was reported to be as high as 40%. 10% is widely quoted in, in uh, older literature, but recently they've said as high as 40%. And that's a staggering number when you think about it. Now, when asked about reporting, 95% of doctors agree that they had a duty, an obligation to report but only 67% of those would report appropriately. And we'll talk about some of the reasons for that as we go on. Uh, part of it is a culture of silence. And it's, it's not just in medicine, it's in the society as a whole. Um, coworkers, family and friends enable the physician to continue without intervention. Um, there is a theory that physicians tend to have a God complex tending to self-treat and diagnose before asking for help. And part of this is uh, an unrealistic expectation of physicians, both by themselves and by other people, um, that spurs this on. There's the fear of loss of career, fear of the consequences to their medical license and personally, the loss of identity as a physician becoming a patient, a strong tendency to self-diagnose and treat, and shame and embarrassment. When asked about failure to report, there's talk of fear of intimidation by the impaired medical staff member, reputation as a whistleblower or a narc. Nobody wants to, you know, tattle on their friend. Fear that nothing will come of the report and the concern that they're actually going to be wrong, that they're uh, over-reading the situation. So I have three scenarios, and I just want you to, to think to yourself, what would I do with each of these scenarios? So a fellow physician has been showing up late to work, and nurses are complaining that he never answers his pager. He failed to come in to see an emergent consult for several hours, and when he did show up, he was disheveled and tremulous, constantly wiping his nose and sniffling. His documentation was fragmented and incomplete. Second scenario is one that we see a lot, and quite frankly, we tend to gloss over as they're just letting off steam. A fellow resident has the reputation as a party animal. At the last surgery get-together, he was observed drinking until he couldn't walk and was later found passed out in the lobby. And the third one, if you can remember back to when you were an intern, a staff physician comes to the operating room without his surgical cap, looking disoriented. When reminded to don it, he begins to talk about mind control devices and how the government is intercepting our thoughts. You are his intern. So I just want you to think about those and realistically, just I'm not going to ask you what you would do, but in your own mind, formulate what you would do as we begin to go through the rest of this talk. 
So the first portion that I'd like to focus on is substance abuse. Now, self-reported lifetime substance abuse and dependence is highest in psychiatrists and emergency room physicians, but all doctors are susceptible. Emergency medicine doctors uh, tend to use illegal drugs, while psychiatrists use benzodiazepines and anesthesiologists opiates. I found it interesting that surgeons mostly are addicted to tobacco. <laughs> But that's not to say that, that these lines don't blur. This is just, you know, what's commonly reported. Uh, and these are self-reports which, uh, as we all know, can be sometimes unreliable. So 8 to 12 percent of physicians develop a substance abuse problem during their career. Re these substance abuse problems are a risk factor for medical malpractice, negligence lawsuits, and development of physical and psychological illness. Um, they can not only compound a physical or psychological illness, but they can bring it on. And I thought that this is very important. So left untreated, the mortality rate among physicians with substance abuse is as high as 17%. 65 to 70% of adults in the, alcohol, in, in the U.S. use alcohol socially and they have no problems. About 2% of those go on to become alcoholics. Two drinks a day for males and one for females is what's considered normal and socially acceptable. Five or more drinks in a single event is equivalent to binge drinking. So there was a survey that was done where they asked some PGY3s, a significant number of them, what their use was in the last 30 days. 87% um, of, the, of them said that they used alcohol and 5% of them says, said that they used it daily. 7% um, use marijuana, 3.5% uh, use benzodiazepines, and 1.5% use cocaine. So, you know, we think that our profession is one that would not be doing these things, but we, we actually fall pretty much along the realm of the general population. So looking at the DSM-5, so they got rid of substance abuse and substance dependence, and they moved to the substance use criteria. It's a maladaptive pattern of substance abuse is manifested by two or more in a 12-month period. And there's a long list of these, so we'll, we'll hit some of the highlights, but I'm not going to read all of these. Um, one of them is legal problems associated with the use, like DUIs. That also goes into legal problems at work, but legal problems at work tend to be a very late sign of substance use. Uh, continued substance use despite persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems like domestic disputes or disruptive behavior at work. Tolerance, which is a need for markedly increased amounts of the substance to get the same effect. Uh, withdrawal, so we are all taught about the, about the classic withdrawal symptoms for drugs. If you start to see these in an individual, uh, that may indicate that they have a substance use problem. And for yourself, thinking about or craving um, a specific substance can be an indication that you have a problem. A persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control substance use, this might be the statement that um, after, you know, partying too much the next day going, I'm never going to touch that again. And then the next time that you have the opportunity, drinking more than you uh, anticipated that you were going to drink. Uh, time spent in activities necessary to obtain the substance, driving long distances to go to new doctors to try to obtain substances because you don't want to be perceived in your own community as a frequent flyer. And then the substance use is continued despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that's likely to have been caused or exacerbated by the substance use. Now, our current medical authorities consider substance dependence to be a neurologic or psychiatric illness that is contributed to by genetic, social, emotional, and psychological problems. The use of the substance provides a temporary sense of psychological and physiologic relief from stressors, and the person repeatedly uses more than intended, resulting in new problems which are then dealt with by repeating the substance use. This definitely leads to a downward spiral in the quality of life, both spiritually, emotionally, and professionally. 
But I don't want you to just take away negative from this talk, because there is hope. Physicians have better treatment outcomes than the general public when long-term monitoring occurs, like with the physician's health programs. Uh, a nine-year study of one of these programs in New Jersey reported a recovery rate of 83.8% with no relapses. And when you took into account the people that did relapse, which normally occurred within the first two years, the success, the success rate was 97.6%. That is well above what we see in the general public. So in moving to mental health, in a uh, United Kingdom physician survey of 3,500 physicians, nearly three quarters of the respondents said they would rather discuss mental health problems with family or friends rather than seek formal or informal advice. They listed reasons as career implications, professional integrity, and the perceived stigma of mental health problems. And the message really is don't talk about it, don't mention it, because mental health is still perceived as a weakness um, in society. So nearly one third of doctors have some kind of mental disorder. And that sounds like a very high number, but you have to think about depression, um, anxiety, panic attacks. Um, all of these fall under the mental health spectrum. Stressful aspects of physician training, such as long hours, um, heavy workloads, estrangement from your supportive network, uh, can all add to the tendency toward dep depressive symptoms in trainees and in working physicians. Uh, harassment and belittlement contribute to mental health problems that used to be, um, in surgery especially, a lot more prevalent, um, but we've really moved away from that. Uh, and, and I think that this is becoming less of a contribution. Um, but there's no data to back me up on that. That's just a, anecdotal. Uh, even positive workplace changes, such as getting a better job, moving jobs, can contribute to job-related stress. So as I said, the DSM-5 has now made the DSM-4 defunct. But I think that it's helpful to talk about access disorders, because that's kind of how we were trained. And we haven't yet moved to the new way of thinking where it's all one uh, big category. So in looking at access disorders, access one disorder symptoms tend to occur during residency and training, include depression, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. They typically respond to outpatient uh, treatment to include medication and psychotherapy. And access one disorders are the most familiar and widely recognized. They're also the ones that uh, people tend to think uh, of that cannot, that people that have these cannot continue to function. Uh, which in this slide we can see is not true. These are major depressive episodes, schizophrenic episode, bipolar disorder, and panic attacks, just to name a few. Looking at access to disorders, these include personality disorders. They're very difficult to manage, uh, sometimes seem untreatable, and they're accompanied by a considerable, considerable social stigma because these people often have a hard time fitting into society. So major depression, uh, lifetime prevalence in male doctors in the US is 12.8%, just slightly higher than the general population. And in females uh, physicians, it's equal to the general female population. But when you look at the suicide risk, you see something completely different. So the suicide risk, uh, relative risk in males is up to three times higher than the general population. And in females, it's five and a half times higher. And 300 to 400 doctors commit suicide each year. That is the equivalent of an entire medical school. They have a higher completion to attempt ratio. So in the, gener in the general population, suicides that are completed by men are about four times higher than that of women. But in physicians, they're actually equivalent. And after accidents, suicide is the second most common cause of death of me among medical students. So you ask, are these people getting help? Well, over 60% of those with suicidal ideation said they're reluctant to, see to seek help due to concern that it could affect their medical license. In a survey that was published in the Archives of Surgery, barriers to seeking help was not enough time, 
uncertain how to get help, and then lack of confidentiality, a, pot a potentially negative impact on their career, and the stigma associated with seeking help were all discussed as barriers. Identifying an impaired physician is the first step towards uh, getting help. There are many warning signs that can aid in identification. And as we read through these, you're going to say to yourself, I see myself in there. I see myself one or two of those. It's not necessarily the individual symptoms. It's a conglomeration and a pattern. Uh, mood swings, overreaction to criticism, <laughs> altercations with patients or peers or staff. A key thing is a change in personality, somebody becoming something that they weren't previously. Uh, obvious ones are an alcohol on breath, slurred speech, uh, frequent drunkenness, uh, DUIs. One that we don't often think about is sexual promiscuity. That can be an early indicator of, uh, of substance abuse or of mental health problems. Uh, shifting of the workload, frequent tardiness or absence, uh, frequent beeper failure, prolonged breaks where they actually go in uh, to the break room and lock the door so that nobody can follow them in, uh, frequent medical complaints without specific diagnoses. And then for surgeons, especially dealing with anesthesiologists, um, with anesthesia, there's the thing of deviation from drug procedures where the patient's not, doesn't seem to be getting enough anesthesia. Um, there's a lot of spillage or breakage and imp improper or uh, unwitnessed wasting. Sleeping on duty. Now, I, I know that all of us can see ourselves in this one. And like I said, it's not a matter of an occasional thing. This is a continued pattern of behavior. But a big one is isolation from the peer group, uh, not coming to social functions, eating alone, not having friends, especially if the person seemed to be social prior um, and now is withdrawing. But the most important sign is a change from the normal behavior pattern. So what is the next step? So if you suspect an impaired physician, it is your obligation to intervene immediately. You have to get them away from patient care because they're a danger not only to themselves but to patients, and that's your first obligation. At Utusca, if an, an individual who's concerned about impairment can call this number, it's the Graduate uh, Medical Education Office. It's an anonymous call. You don't have to identify yourself. You can report to your program director or supervisor. And you may confront the, the uh, individual directly. Now, in some of the literature, they say this is the best thing to do. And, and then you read other literature that says with the high rate of denial, it tends to escalate very rapidly into a confrontation, and nothing is solved by it. So the best approach usually is to contact your state physician's health program. They have a multidisciplinary team which is set up to evaluate and then intervene and um, not your state medical board. The state medical board generally will just refer you to the physician's health program, unless there has been uh, something legal that has happened, and then it goes to the Texas Medical Board for further disciplinary action and review. So the Texas Physician's Health Program was created by the 81st Texas Legislature in 2009, but didn't become operational until February of 2010. It's self-funded through user fees, which are $1,200 a year. Uh, that does not include additional monitoring, such as monitoring of bodily fluids or treatment for their ongoing problems. Those are borne by the uh, participant themselves. And their vision really is that people will recognize that psychiatric and substance use disorders are medical conditions that are treatable. Uh, they want people to to participate in the program and to have an ongoing license uh, and an ability to practice medicine in their field of expertise both safely and effectively. There's usually a five-year follow-up period as we discussed earlier, but that can vary from person to person, uh, especially if you've had a relapse early in the time frame that may extend it. And if you're doing well, you can ask for uh, 
an early um, end to your follow-up period. It requires a signed contract delineating the program requirements, and if you don't meet these, then you get referred to the, to the Texas Medical Board for a disciplinary action. Uh, it's a non-punitive process, really focused on rehabilitation. But as I said, if you, if you fail to meet the requirements, then it does become uh, a disciplinary process. And many programs have demonstrated up to 90% recovery rates. Um, when you look at the literature, it varies, but it's somewhere between 70 and 97. Um, and those have to do with how they calculate their uh, relapses in there. Um, because I, as I said, relapses are common. And the reason that they're common is um, that you're going back to the same environment uh, that you had the initial problem in. And so physicians, for physicians, that makes it very difficult to change their lifestyle. Uh, in summary, so the approach to the impaired physician has changed greatly over the years. It's gone from a punitive process where the person themselves was uh, declared as just having deviant behavior to going towards more of a rehabilitation process, but there's still a really long way to go. Uh, a significant number of physicians are impacted by substance abuse or mental health disorders during their career. And declining job performance is often a late sign. Uh, impaired physicians tend to be highly functional. And they will go a very long time having very minor uh, problems until they have the big one. And so that's why in talking about identifying the impaired physician, we went through that list of things that you can help to identify, um, and also looking for depression and anxiety symptoms. I forgot to mention those. Uh, it is your obligation to intervene when an impaired colleague is identified or suspected. And it's important for us to, to move even further uh, towards the idea that these are medical conditions that are treatable. They don't necessarily imply that the person uh, cannot be occupationally functional. And referring a colleague is not a betrayal of trust. It's an act of responsibility to contain and prevent the problem of impairment. It really could save a career and possibly a life. Questions? hundred suicides a year, do they break it down by specialty um, or age group? So, I mean, it's, no, I didn't look into the breakdown. Uh, I was looking at um, just the, the total number of suicides. And the problem is, is it's actually a little underreported because they went off of um, autopsy data, and some of those autopsies were classified as accidental deaths. And so it may actually be a little underreported. So 400 out of? 300 to 400. Out of 850,000 physicians, the percentage is still pretty low. I mean, it's still pretty low, but that's a significant amount of physicians to, lo to lose a year. When it's preventable, it's something that we have the opportunity to intervene on. And as health professionals, we would you would think that we would have the lowest suicide rate of anyone since you know, we help treat people that have depression and anxiety and the substance use problems uh, all the time. Any questions for Dr. Hancock? Yes, Dr. Stewart. Dr. Stewart. So, so I would think I would probably be one of the most knowledgeable people about this question I'm about to ask. So uh, you talked about reporting. I think that's the thing that people struggle with. You emphasized it at multiple places in your talk about, about reporting. I think there's still general confusion of how best to do that. In other words, do I confront you? Do I come and talk to you? Uh, you talk about calling the physician, uh, the physician's health program. Yes, sir. You can just call that number and you can say, hey, you know, I have concerns that uh, Ronald M. Stewart is impaired and blah, blah, blah. And then they're going to contact me, or how does that work? So what actually happens is they do a review of the case um, and of the, uh, of the complaints that are issued. They see if there's validity to it. 
um, before contacting you. Then they contact you, ask basically your side of the story, but they gather information from alternative sources as well. And then they do a review, a um, basically coming down, uh, interviewing you or having you come up to Austin, uh, interviewing you and finding out is there a problem, has there been uh, any complaints, um, which is ma the main inciting factor um, for them intervening is if you had any complaints because they hope that you would self-report. That's what we're all trying to work towards is that the impaired position will be able to self-report instead of being reported by a colleague. Um, but they will do a full review, and if they find a problem, then they have intervention. And you, you, you can self-report, correct? Yes, I mean, you, you can self-report. That's, that's their preferred approach. That is, is the that preferred I approach. self-report the physician's health program. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you are, a, are an individual that feels like you may have a problem, the ideal situation is that you would report and remove yourself from uh, harming anyone by yourself. And you can self-report before it becomes a problem um, to where you don't actually have a lengthy impact on uh, or time away from your career. Probably the institution of that program makes a real difference. I know we had an instance of a, an ENT physician uh, on the faculty here uh, who had treated more nosebleeds with cocaine uh, than the country in a total. Um, and there was no mechanism like that, and I mean, he just got his career destroyed. There was no intervention. He was just picked out, fired, and lost his medical license. And, and that is how it used to be. Um, and there has been a lot, of, a lot of pushback from the medical community, uh, physicians included, to not move towards uh, a rehabilitation style program because there's still um, some thought that it's the individual's uh, deviant behavior that is causing it and um, that they should be punished. And it's taken a long time, uh, several years, and a lot of legislation, which I didn't go into. I mean, there's a lot of legislation that has actually come forward to get us to the point where we're at. Um, but there's a lot still to be done because individual bias is still out there. Dr. Stewart, you had another? No, I was just thinking about, so, so the self-reporting, I mean, the, the ideal that you would want is you would want people to self-report before they're, they have a functional impairment, right? I mean, that's yes. what you really, I mean, so it, I think, so you have to, I mean, you, know, you have to think about it from the, from the person who's practicing's point of view. They don't, want to, they don't want to report because they don't want to be stigmatized. They don't want to impact their, their professional standing, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of reasons why. The, uh, so they delay reporting yes. uh, till there is a functional problem or somebody else reports them. I mean, it seems the goal would be that you would, that you would report early. And I guess the question is how to encourage that. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think, I'm going to just part of the job of, of this is to be skeptical that I, I would guess that a program based out of Austin Let's say, let's say these numbers, I mean, you, you cited some of the data. There's surveys of surgeons just, I mean, I think you know, the American College of Surgeons uh, has surveyed surgeons, and the, the substance abuse uh, prevalence in surgeons, is do, I know, substance use, whatever, yes. is problem use of alcohol in particular is up to 25%. I mean, it's uh, 25 to 40%. So it's, it's, it's hard to envision that, you know, 25% or let's say even 10% of the physician population could be handled centrally through Austin, it just seems a little uh, uh, troubling. Yeah, no, I, and I agree. Um, they, Texas Physicians Health Program is a very small board. Um, it's 11 physicians that handle uh, all of the cases that come through in a year, which at any given time can be, um, is more than 45 physicians, that you are looking at uh, quarterly reports from both psychiatrists or substance use counselors, work site monitors, uh, you have to go and actually do site visits. I mean, there's a, a lot that goes into it. The initial um, meeting with the individual to sign their contract and really get to the root of the problem. Um, it's not a perfect, you know, it's not, it's not a panacea. It's not the perfect 
uh, solution, but I think that it does provide a way for physicians who have a problem to at least start getting help. And also, I, I think you know, I mean, the, the, there's a Bear County Medical Society program similar that's tied into this as well. So I think, so I think that's another way, other than going directly to Austin, is the physician wellness of the Bear County Medical Society. Because I do think it is, a, having been through, having walked people through this, I think it's the, more, the closer you get to the local environment, the more difficult it is for the person, and yes. the less likely they are to, to report. In other words, if, if you're having to go to me to do all this, let, let's say Dr. Srinik's having to come to me to do it, there's a disincentive for him to do it, yes. to come to me. I mean, there just is, because... I'm the person who's, who, who, who could potentially have negative impact to them. So I, I think that's the other option is the Bear County Medical Society ties into that same program. I think this is a really good talk and a really important issue. I really appreciate you talking about it. And there's, there's also a lot of resources online. If you just Google the impaired physician, you will see multiple societies that have information that can help with both rehabilitation and identification. Uh, they have hotlines. I mean, there there are so, so many resources out there that um, are are simply available if you just need need them. Just look. Dr. Portillo. Yeah, I recently obtained my Texas medical license and one of the requirements to undergo a jurisprudence uh, exam. And they've made it very clearly. If you self-report yourself, we won't even put as a public information that you are on the review, or, and then after you complete the program or training or, or whatever you need to go, a license can be an option too. On the other hand, if somebody reports you or they find out that you have a problem, then they will not only uh, suspend your license, they will also put it as a public where any patient can Google your name or on the database and then you will... There's one, one thing about that is if somebody reports you um, and it was before there is a legal issue, that's not necessarily uh, that you're going to have a disciplinary process with the Texas Medical Board. They may just refer you to the physician's health program. It's when you start to have uh, actual problems where there's patient safety involved, or you've had uh, something legal action taken against you that it becomes a Texas Medical Board issue. So I, I want, and I want you all to understand that the person who is referring the physician is kept anonymous um, and you're protected. There was, at one time you could be sued for reporting a colleague for slander and defamation of character. Um, that is, is no longer the case. Protected, no. You're protected. Dr. Hassan. So um, it seems like from the job we are assuming that that physician or that person, uh, he knows about his problem. And the most of, as I remember from the psychiatry lecture, the majority of patients with psychiatric issues or substance abuse, they, they are with self-denial. They don't know they, are, they have this problem. Uh, I think one of the main issues we are missing in the medical field uh, in the regular life, you can, you can see there's like interventions, there are families, there are friends that can uh, probably point this before it's being obvious at the, in the world. However, when you are in the medical field, probably most of your time is in the medical field, most of your friends in the medical field. So they're going to be, uh, they are your friends because they are the one who's supposed to report you uh, in this situation. So I think we are missing the social circle that can do kind of intervention inside the world before making well, and that's, that's kind of part of the reason why I wanted to give this talk is, I mean, every physician should be cognizant of this problem. And, and I really wasn't, you know. And I think that if, if more of us are aware about the numbers of individuals that are affected, um, about, you know, just applying what we've learned in medical school to our own colleagues, that you know, we can, we can make interventions that mean something. And it doesn't mean that, that every physician that, you know, binge drinks needs to go to the Texas Physicians Health Program, okay? It may just be a simple intervention of, you know, the program director, the head of surgery sitting down with them saying, look, you know, at the last uh, surgery party, you got a little carried away, and uh, do you need help? You know, maybe we can get you in and just be evaluated. You know, I mean... And maybe it ends there. 
and they don't develop a problem. But, you know, it's something that, you know, we all, like the Snickers, you know, it's kind of like, oh, you know, we all do this. We all blow off steam. But for some people, it's a recurrent problem. And it may be the first indication that they, that they truly have a problem at home. I was surprised about tobacco. Yeah. Uh, in my class of 100 uh, in medical school, 95 of us were out smoking uh, in between every lecture, uh, first and second year. And we used to go to our national surgery meetings, and there was a cloud. I mean, you didn't even have to buy a cigarette, or much less light one. <laughs> All you had to do was breathe. <laughs> And now, for the past 15 years, if any surgeon lights up a cigarette, he is atta virtually attacked by 10 doctors. You know, and we really don't see people smoking. Ronnie, I, I don't know about the, the, we just don't see people smoking at our national meetings. Well, now anymore. we dip or we do vaporizers. <laughs> I, mean, I would say, to, to me, I think the most common substance abuse by surgeons is obvious is alcohol. That, that, that's, that's, I mean, that's just, that, to me, that's. I mean, and some people jokingly say the surgeon thinks you have alcohol problem when you drink more than they do. I mean, which is hard to do. Uh, and so, 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 so I think that's I think that's the, probably the number one problem. I think these ACS studies. It's interesting. That there's a group of women surgeons who have questioned this because the prevalence rate for women surgeons was higher than men. But in reality, if you look at the amount of alcohol they were talking about, uh, a glass of wine a day would have classified some of those women as having a substance yes. use problem. So I think that's probably the number one problem. The, the other thing I would I would ask just your comment on, which you didn't talk on, is what I would call general hygiene in the environment. Okay, so so that I'm not talking about cleanliness here, but 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 it's I think it's well known that people who have access one disorders that with good social support system and regular uh, nutrition, exercise, uh, people around them, family and friends, do better than people who are isolated. I think it's one of the things that you all do better as residents and that the program does better with respect to emphasizing those things. But I think, you know, ex regular exercise, nutrition, managing, we, we're going to have be tired, but managing your sleep deficit as best you can, friends, family, humor, prayer, meditation, I think all those things probably minimize to some degree the problems you're talking about. And even for the people who have access one disorders, probably significantly help that. Yeah, that's true. One, one thing I learned from my father uh, with his business is people who don't show up for work on Mondays. He was always suspicious and found a high incidence, not showing up late, Dr. Stewart, just not showing up at all. <laughs> <laughs> Ching. Uh, <laughs> but that was an indicator of people who had a problem. Usually, you know, back when we were thinking of alcohol in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd like to point out Dr. Hassan tells us that he passed his written test for citizenship uh, on Friday. <laughs> I pre-tested him the week before he failed every question, <laughs> including who, who was buried in Grant's tomb. But <laughs> onward. Dr. Portillo. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Guillermo Portillo, one of the chief residents. Let's see if I can make it happen. Uh, I don't have any commercial or financial relationships. <clears throat> the case I'm presenting is uh, Mr. LD. The complication being presented is IRDS. This patient also self-extubate himself, and he also have a C. diff infection. 
the operation that we uh, completed was a completion gastrectomy, ruined white esophago jejunostomy, uh, and uh, implantation of uh, xenograft around the anastomosis. I think uh, this gentleman complication was mostly uh, related to the nature of disease. There is obviously uh, involved judgment and technique, and maybe not so much medical systems. Um, this uh, LD is a 52-year-old gentleman with previous history of adenocarcinoma. He underwent in 2012 uh, ME gastrectomy for this. Uh, at that time, the pathology uh, classification was T1 and 2. Uh, he was found to have four positive lymph nodes. Um, there was positive margin of resection in the, in the proximal aspect. He, uh, after the operation, underwent uh, chemo, uh, chemo and radiation therapy. He uh, was not operated by us, and uh, after he completed the uh, chemo radiation, he, uh, not surprisingly, uh, was found to have a recurrence of the gastrojejunal anastomosis. At that time, he was referred to our clinic, where we evaluate him for uh, a new operation, uh, taking into account that he was a 52-year-old gentleman, and the uh, PET scan and CT scan evaluation of him didn't prove any distal metastasis. Uh, he had history of tobacco and alcohol abuse, which has been since uh, corrected, uh, history of hypertension, hepatitis C, hyperlipidemia, and overweight, mm -hmm. history of total uh, thyroidectomy because of medullary cancer. As far as the timeline, 2012, uh, ME gastrectomy with possible uh, margin of resection. He did not underwent any op new operation, underwent the chemo radiation. We uh, came to new the patient in November 2012. He was promptly uh, booked for uh, to completion gastrectomy, uh, which was completed on December 12th. This operation um, was uh, complicated by the fact that he underwent radiation before our operation, and uh, we took at least 45 minutes of uh, a list of additions. Uh, other than that, he had already a configuration of ruin Y, so we basically did an oncologic resection of the GJ and completed the gastrectomy. And then with the previous uh, rule limb that it was already in place, we just uh, hooked it to the esophagus. We did a Hanson anastomosis with a, a silk. Um, after we completed the anastomosis, we put a, a piece of a xenograft implant around the anastomosis to buttress the anastomosis in, a, in, a, in that fashion. Um, the operation went fine. There was uh, about 50 to 75 cc's of uh, blood uh, uh, loss during the case. There was no complication reported. There was no hypotension. There was no hypoxia. There was no uh, any, any indication. He went to recover to the floor. Uh, next day, he was found to have some uh, respiratory um, uh, difficulty. Uh, he had uh, some uh, shortness of breath. Uh, a CT scan P protocol was done, didn't prove any PE as a primary diagnosis. He underwent uh, aggressive pulmonary toilet with a nebulization, ECPAP. Uh, um, he continued to deteriorate his respiratory status up until uh, uh, December uh, 14. Uh, he was admitted to the unit, and then uh, several hours after, he was uh, intubated because of continued deterioration on, uh, on his uh, ventilatory parameters with hypercapnia and, uh, and elaborated uh, uh, breathing. Uh, this is the x-ray when he got intubated in the ICU. You can see uh, for the medical students, uh, infiltrates on both lungs, uh, clearly evident with this white patchy opacities bilaterally. Um, he went to uh, respond well to the mechanical ventilation. Uh, we worried that this was related to <coughs> sepsis uh, coming from a leak on a esophagogeginostomy, uh, even though there was a drain and this was not having any uh, uh, suspicious output. Uh, we went ahead and interrogated that anastomosis with a new CT scan with contrast. We didn't prove any extravasation of the contrast through the anastomosis. Um, the, actually, the CT scan looked at, uh, uh, appropriate. Uh, nevertheless, we started on broad spectrum antibiotics, and also he underwent a bronchoscopy. This BAL that was obtained didn't, didn't grow anything, didn't have any grow, and at some point the antibiotics were stopped. He, this as anastomosis was also interrogated several days after, again with a new uh, swallow study, which didn't prove uh, any, any leakage around the esophageal genostomy. Um, the day he self-extubated, this is the x-ray that he had. Uh, we were very concerned because at some point he recorded very high uh, FI2s and uh, PIPs, uh, but Basically, with the support treatment, he, he started to improve day by day up until he self-extubated. Um, I don't know if you have any questions about the presentation. I'm going to go about the discussion. Uh, we were 
very surprised about how he um, how he had uh, uh, otherwise healthy patient that go to a full blown IRDS with uh, uh, very uh, 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 requiring uh, high parameters of mechanical ventilation, and obviously we we worry that most of the time and the the, the thing that you can make a change is the sepsis related IRDS. In this case, we didn't prove any isolated any microorganism in blood. We didn't have any leak on the esophageal genostomy. We didn't have any positive uh, bacteria on the BAL. Uh, there was not reported by anesthesiology any kind of a, a, a aspiration episode, and also he had previous hemigastrectomy, which will impair the gastric acid secretion, and he was also on a, a, on a, a PPI before the operation, so there was no much that he could even could bronchoaspirate it. There is clear studies that the aspiration of gastric fluids or gastric particles or the combination will, if you do a timeline and you have uh, the rats and administer this, you will see a clear decrease on the oxygens. But in this case, it's difficult to think, even though that's the only or more possible explanation that we have. Um, the patient did not have also pneumonia. We didn't have any procedures. He did have, um, uh, as far as other risk factors, he didn't have a blood transfusion. Um, blood transfusion can be important in the sense of the trial, one in every 15,000. This is an upside question every year. This is the one that, uh, kind of like a donor versus host, the, the antibodies uh, goes against donor antibodies against host white blood cells. Uh, it's a very interesting topic, but that generally gets asked in the, in the upside. He didn't have any blood transfusion of FFPs or RBCs. Um, he did have previous history of uh, uh, alcohol use, but not currently. So as far as the risk factors, maybe thoracic radiation, which he had, aspiration, even though we didn't notice, and he did have half of his stomach already out, that's the, one of the possibilities. Uh, another, another option is also the history of alcohol abuse can predispose somebody to the IRDS. Um, we didn't have him on fluid overload, but he had the previous radiation and chemotherapy, which maybe play a role into, into the presentation. Uh, early on sepsis, well, that's what we thought initially, but uh, we, didn't, we never were able to prove him. Um, so maybe the combination before uh, the previous radiation and, and chemotherapy and the bronchial aspiration uh, tilting him into a, into a very severe IRDS. This kind of IRDS that's related to aspiration is, uh, has also high mortality, not as high as the one by sepsis, but it's accounted uh, as, as far as maybe 20 to 30 percent of the mortality is related to anesthesia. So it's a very... Uh, um, it's more prominent than maybe what we imagine. And in the studies that they have done uh, proving uh, aspiration, it's, it's not as uncommon as you might think. The thing is not everybody goes to develop full-blown IRDS or acute lung injury. Uh, as far as the studies for IRDS, uh, the classic studies, uh, it's pretty interesting that IRDS was only described less than 50 years ago, which is you know, maybe the age of one of, our, of most of our staff. So. Uh, is, is very young or description. Um, the classic question in the upside is the tidal volume, you know, the strategies to manage the uh, IRDS, and it's eight cc's per kilo. So everybody, every year you can ask. The most recent study is this is a study of albuterol versus placebo, which didn't prove any beneficial effects and even proved to be even harmful. There has some discussion about the nutrition in the Eden study. They were trying to see if trophic versus full-blown uh, fits would make a difference in patients that would survive, and there was no difference between the, both groups. The addition of omega-3 and omega-6 uh, nutrition and antioxidants were also didn't prove any beneficial effect and even proved it to be uh, potentially harmful. And the most recent uh, uh, line of study is the study of uh, ros uh, the statins, rosuvastatin and simvastatin. Rosuvastatin didn't prove any benefits in patients and even was harmful because of the kidney and liver failure that um, was associated to. And the simvastatin, uh, of the, one of the most recent studies, 2014, uh, didn't prove any benefit. Uh, statin was used because of the properties about uh, inhibition of the uh, activate protein C, inhibition of uh, tissue factor. Uh, and stabilization of, of, of the inflammation, but didn't prove any benefits. So uh, as far as the new years, there is no new magic uh, uh, treatment for IRDS. It's just mostly support and treating the primary source. Uh, 
What I will do different? Well, the operation was indicated for sure he had cancer. He was young. He didn't have any metastasis. So he uh, for sure uh, was indicated. Was the complication preventable? Uh, I've been looking back into the chart, and uh, it seems a little bit difficult to see how, how could have we prevented a full throne uh, IRDS. Um, and has the complication could be detected early? Uh, I think we, we identified that the patient had breathing problems. He was placed in the unit um, uh, several, hour, uh, several, several hours before being or requiring to be intubated. So I guess this is one of those that uh, we can blame the aspiration and previous radiation. And uh, I don't know if anybody wants uh, to make a comment or have a question. His uh, partial gastrectomy was at another institution, correctly? I was at this institution, it another was. another surgical team. Do you know whether he got any neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy? No, he was partially <coughs> without any neoadjuvant. Is that pretty much, uh, Dr. Jatoy, everybody with gastric cancer is going to get neoadjuvant? Well, I, I, you know, not necessarily. I mean, I don't think you know, the adjuvant uh, chemotherapy is going to be better. Whether you get it before or after, is, 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 I think, depends on the, on the on the clinical presentation. There are studies showing that the neoadjuvant decreases the size of the tumor right. and will no, go no. ahead and knock the nodes out. I've had about three patients now when we operated on them. They had a mass there. I couldn't tell whether the cancer was still there, but on path pathology, there was no cancer left in the specimen. Yeah, so it, it makes the recession easier. But whether it actually improves the overall overall survival. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is the uh, argument about uh, partial gastrectomy versus total gastrectomy with the recurrence and an anastomosis. Uh, most of my mentors were always opting for a total gastrectomy just because of subucal so lymphatic spread of the tumor. You never know exactly where the margins are going to be. The pathologist is not going to see it when they go ahead and bring it up uh, to look at the specimen intraoperatively. Dr. Stewart? So, a uh, nice presentation. And, you know, you, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out what was the inciting event. If you look at, the, you know, if you, if to really have ARDS, if you look at the, the new Berlin criteria, they're essentially saying what people have said all along, that you need an inciting event, some something that caused it other than primary lung disease. So I think it's appropriate to spend a lot of time thinking about, thinking about I'm not certain you've convinced me yet what was the inciting event, and I'm not asking you to, but you left out some things that I think might have helped. Like, what did his CAT scan look like initially? Did he have patchy, diffuse infiltrates throughout his lung and CAT scan? Or did he have posterior dependent atelectasis? It was patchy infiltrates bilaterally. So to me, that, that would, so, so if you have patchy infiltrates bilaterally, that's going to imply either pneumonia, okay, so, so, and there are other, you know, there are, he's got a lot of, he's high mileage, has a lot of problems, so there are viral, he, he could have potentially some viral syndrome. This is a, this was a, a topic of interest 15 years ago is, you know, the emergence of viral.